back in the day, if you wanted to get information, there was basically three places that you could get it from, right? NBC, ABC, and CBS, right? The big three. Um, if you had an idea and you wanted to share it, uh, you wanted to communicate your idea to other people through uh, some kind of medium that had a chance to getting out to lots of people, you had to pitch somebody who was essentially a gatekeeper. Right? You had to pitch your producer on my idea for this information, you had to be convinced that they could sell advertising, that they would get Nielsen ratings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And if you didn't have that, basically what you had was public access with no one to watch it. You track it? So today, uh, even ABC, NBC, and CBS are on what? Facebook. They all have Facebook pages. They all have YouTube channels. They all are on Twitter. Why? Because that is where people are being reached. And what's great about it is um, anybody anybody can get on it without having to convince somebody else that there's money behind it, right? So so there was no Breitbart, and now there is. There was no Daily Caller or Daily Signal, and now there is. Or any other blog. I mean, somebody here at Kitsap could start a blog that eventually got noticed because it's got consistently great ideas that becomes the next big thing, potentially. Um, <clears throat> I mean, if they didn't get uh, harassed and doxxed uh, by, by uh, Emerald City Antifa. Um, the point is, is that um, there's free access to share information, and social media allows us to rapidly spread that information and to get connected with each other. It's, it's almost purpose-built technology for the purpose of activism. Uh, so, uh, who, who's already on Facebook now? Let's see, show hands. Most of us. Okay. So I'm going to talk. I kind of prepared this when I was talking with Kelly uh, for the idea that um, for somebody that's never been on Facebook and doesn't know how to set it up, and for anybody that is in that situation, if, if uh, I sufficiently convince you that you'd like to be on Facebook, I will stick around after. I can show you on my phone. I can even email you kind of a tutorial video that I recorded today and it shows you how to get started. So why? Why would we want to do this? Um, <clears throat> Tea Party is an activist group, right? We're interested in being politically active to, to inform people about what's happening in Kitsap, what's happening in Washington State, and kind of in a grander scale, what's happening in our nation, right? Um, there are people that you know in your life, uh, family members and friends, that probably feel the same way that you do about the issues, but can't always make it to the meetings. Plus. Uh, even if you can't, could make it to the meetings all the time, there's just so much information to keep up with, right? I mean, it's overwhelming sometimes how much information there is. I didn't even know that Notre Dame Cathedral was on fire until I got here because I wasn't on social media much personally myself today, so I didn't catch the news. There's just so much happening all the time. I mean, I get to use the, the issue with uh, transgender. It's like, um, I just came out of nowhere, all of a sudden it's here and it's something that we have to deal with. I put my kids in private school, my daughter is six, she likes unicorns and dancing, and has no idea what sex is, and I don't want her to know what that is yet, because she's six, and she likes unicorns, you know? <laughs> she's missing her second front tooth, it's probably gonna fall out tonight, you know? But there's nothing age appropriate for her to learn about that topic. Especially when you throw transgender, the rate of information uh, that's coming at us and how quickly and rapidly the world is changing, it boggles the mind, right? Um, the idea, I mean, I remember, I was pretty young, but I remember when the wall came down. Did you ever think in your life that you would be hearing American mainstream people talking about socialism like, yay, we should be doing that because we're so oppressed? Anyone? No. I mean, we fought the Cold War to stop <coughs> communism and Marxism, and now people are like, oh, but we should give that a try. I saw a video on Facebook in like the last two days, it was over the weekend. Um, it was uh, Prager University, if you haven't heard of that, you can definitely check it out. Lots of great videos that they have on YouTube and they share on Facebook. Um, and it's, uh, it's a really short one. Uh, it's a young guy who goes up to these two girls that look like they're on a the beach, and they both have, each of them, between the two girls, they have four Vente Starbucks drinks. And he's like, you guys love Starbucks? And they're like, oh my gosh, I love Starbucks. Starbucks is so great. And he's like, yay, capitalism, huh? And they're like, F capitalism and F corporatism. And it's like, the video just kind of ends there, and you're like, 
did you hear what you just said? You know, but this is the kind of thing that's happening where, where people are being indoctrinated. Uh, it, it, for, for those who were able to make it to our Lincoln Day dinner, um, Dr. Duke Pesto was amazing. And he's got tons of videos on YouTube, uh, and I'm sure that he's got a Facebook page, um, and there's tons more information about that. But, you know, but the, his, basically the message in, uh, in a nutshell is that uh, our public education system is now um, an indoctrination center for a specific kind of ideology, and specifically not to teach people how to think, much less how to think critically, but just to memorize, you know, contour math. Like, you might know that three times three is nine, but if you can't show the steps of how to get there, you don't get credit for it. That's ridiculous, and that's just scratching the surface with test scores going down and down and down. Um, that kind of a thing, where they're being indoctrinated, is to, you know, like, here they are enjoying the fruits of free market capitalism, that they chose to pay their money to. And then you say, yay, capitalism, and it triggers, you know, with the Pavlov response, F capitalism and corporatism. That's a bad thing that I just gave my money to. It's just, you know, like, uh, those kind of people are organizing. Those kind of people are going to support Bernie or whoever gets the nomination. I don't know if you noticed, every single Democratic candidate that's announced for president rushed to endorse the Green New Deal. Uh, they say, oh, it's, it's, uh, it's going to require a massive government takeover of lots of things, and then they get backlash for that fact. And they go, oh, well, you know, the Republicans are trying to make it sound like, you know, it's this massive government takeover. When you can go and find a video of, of uh, occasional cortex, as I like to call her, saying, um, yeah, it's going to require government massive takeover in it on a large scale. Oh, well, no, but it's not really. Uh, you know, all oh, the world's going to end in 12 years if we don't do this and, and fix climate control, climate change. Uh, um, but uh, and the biggest thing you're worried about is how to pay for it. And I don't remember exactly what the estimate is and how many trillions it's going to cost to try to implement these things. I mean, it's basically impossible. Um, but uh, the the kind of people that would grab either two Starbucks drinks, one for each hand, and then say. We think that this is terrible, this thing that we're supporting, or the people that will support those kinds of ideas. So, so what do we do? We get connected with each other and we share information. So uh, if you're politically active or if you're a uh, higher than normal consumer of political information, then you need to share that with other people that don't know what's going on as much. Share that with people that, uh, that can't come to Tea Party meetings. Share that with people that can't go to the Olympic conference, right? I'm excited about that. Uh, ready to go last year, as uh, uh, we had child coverage issues, but this year we're hoping to go. Um, so, uh, so the first step you want to do is create a Facebook account, and I actually created a little tutorial video where I'm on my computer and record the screen, uh, and I sent myself a, a shared link that I can send to anybody an email. I could also give you that afterwards if. You're starting from zero, and it's my mom. I help her with everything, all things computer. She's kind of no tech, so I totally get it. Um, and if that's you, and you still want to get involved, I can help you with that. So the first thing you want to do is go to Facebook, Facebook.com, sign up, and then next step, follow the Tea Party, follow Kids Up Tea Party. There's a little search bar, just like in Google. Facebook has kind of got its own search engine, very much just like searching on Google. Uh, you can type in Kids Up Tea Party. And you'll find the Tea Party page, click on it, go to the page. There's a like button. You hit like. Now you start to see any posts that the Tea Party page puts out. Next step after that, follow the Olympic Conference. They have a page too on Facebook. We were looking at it earlier tonight. Tons of great stuff on it. Not only just about the conference itself, but also some really great quotes from people like Jefferson and other people. Things to get people to think about what kind of a world that we want to live in. Right? That's really kind of what's at stake. Um, you know, like I, I mentioned earlier, I thought the 2008 ele election was was intense, um, and like it was an important election. And then, uh, and I thought, uh, you know, when Barack Obama first when first heard that he was a candidate running, I thought there's no way, there's no way that that people in America are going to uh, vote for a guy whose name is Barack Hussein Obama. It sounds too much like Bin Laden. You know, uh, so you know, like, but then I was wrong, and then, but then, uh, you know, we had a, a kind of a terrible four years. Oh, it's not my fault. I inherited a mess. You guys will remember all this stuff. And I thought, okay, so 
uh, we're in a great shape, we have a chance, you know, and then um, it's like, just don't screw up on me, right? <laughs> don't fall asleep during the debates. Um, and then, uh, but it's felt like we were, like we're running out of chances to, to turn things around. Does it feel like that? Like, like we're, we're headed towards uh, in a direction that probably everyone here would agree we don't want to go. I don't want my kids to be faced with this stuff. I don't want to even have to deal with this stuff, but I'm willing to stand in the gap um, and, and fight for the world that I want my kids to have um, now. Uh, and, and for you and your kids and your grandkids, I'm sure you can feel the same way. So uh, after you sign up for Facebook, or if you already have one, and follow the Tea Party and the Olympic Conference, um, get connected with each other. This is the power of social media, being social and able to rapidly share information. There's no way that most of us could look at all of the news sources that, uh, that are not the American equivalent of profit, right, like, like the New York Times is now. Um, there's no way that we can look at every article that comes out on Breitbart or Town Hall or whatever the sites that we're looking at or the podcasts that get shared by guys like Jordan Peterson or the Ruben Report um, and catch all of the nuggets of information. This is why we even know what fake news is because, because of the internet. Because if everybody had to go through the big three, the NBC, ABC, CBSs of the world, we would just be getting the official story instead of finding out that this is, that, that, that this is fake news, that this is propaganda. Uh, and so because there's so much that's out there, um, you might see something. You might see something and you share that and then the people that you're connected with see that. And that's how we use Facebook to be more politically active, to share the correct information so that one person at a time, each of, you know, we can reach more people so that they can learn that, no, this is not accurate. No, pollution did not happen. No, Pfizer reports based on nothing, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it, it's going to take uh, sharing information with one person at a time, and then activism events like uh, the conference, and um, people who have conservative beliefs signing up to be precinct committee officer in your local precinct, um, and getting to know your neighbors and getting them registered to vote, and supporting conservative candidates. And that's kind of what we're doing on the, uh, the conservative Republican side. So. Um, that's basically the gist of it. Um, everybody benefits by sharing. It's easy to share. It's easy to connect with friends and family and share. Um, and some other notes in there, like uh, there's 2.3 billion people plus on Facebook. Did you know that? It's like a quarter of the world is on Facebook. Plus, then there's all the people on like, like YouTube. Is like a billion. So, anyways, so there's just there's a, a lot that we can do. Um, interacting with each other, and uh, this is like going from washing clothes by hand to having a washing and drying machine, but the speed of which, by which we can share the right information is exponentially faster. And the social network app, the human network part, we just got to speed that too. So that's everything. It's a giant coming up. I don't know how much time to take it, but I think it's probably good enough. Thank you. Everyone. And now uh, we know this uh, this young man. Well, yeah, it is it is the young man now. Mm -hmm. but I was just remarking how much younger he is than I am. <laughs> but as secretary of the uh, Kitsap County uh, Republican Board of Directors, you probably have a really big title, right? Uh, as secretary of the executive board of Kitsap Kitsap Republicans. So what I want to see at the next meeting is somebody's iPhone picture with him taking his notes with a team party pin. What do you think? You think we can manage that? So thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. All right. And he will be around afterwards uh, to answer your Facebook questions. You know, particularly if, if you you know need a little uh, help, either he talked a lot about setup, but just maybe how to improve your uh, your posting skills, or your uh, how you're managing your brand, or your, your personal name and reputation, I bet you can help with that easily, right? Sure. Okay. All right. Now we're going to move into the the 
the biggest story of persistence that I've heard in a great long time. You know, we hear a lot about how groups, small groups, even from the time of the revolution, how a, uh, a reasonably small number of people, but it's a number of people, that motivated change on a massive scale. But occasionally, uh, we have the rare opportunity to meet individuals whose persistence is so strong, they're able to move mountains of legislation. To tell a little bit about our personal story and the success of, uh, I don't know if it's been voted on finally the Senate, has it? Still the committee? Senate building passed nearly identical, so okay. wait for that. Okay, so over 40 years, as I recall, of persistence to get the job done and closed. What does it take? What are the barriers? How can she share to us how we can do a better job in personal actions? Welcome, Diana Griffin. teenagers and one of our first dates was actually here and it's kind of nice to be able to share with you in this building um, well it's been 27 years so <laughs> it's been a little while but um, Dan and I met and we hit it off right away it was a blind date and um, I really liked him but I was very very shy and I couldn't actually make direct eye contact and so the date was pretty dull we watched a couple of movies didn't talk much and he was getting ready to leave and I thought you know what it's now or never you better get your courage up so I said, hey, do you want to sit and talk for a while? And he said, yes. And I think he thought it was a pretty horrible date and he didn't want it to end as badly as it was. So we sat and we talked till 6 a.m. And we just hit it off. And um, the following week he took me out on a date. He took me to the Capitol because he thought that was a really cool place. And we went through the halls and looked at all the pictures on the wall and all the history was just amazing. And we were just very fond of all that it took to create our country, to establish our state, for all the things and all the sacrifices that went into it to make it what it is today. And um, I know that things might look dire right now, but I, I'm kind of an optimist and I, I just see so much potential. I see so much potential in this room. I see potential on Facebook. I think we had a really excellent speaker earlier. And um, so going further in, uh, after our date, my, my husband was really um, good at getting me home on curfew. I wasn't as up on that. But he got me there, he pulled in the driveway, and my stepdad's car was there, and he had been gone for quite some time, and he had uh, been molesting me for years. And I froze, and I told my new best friend why. I told him everything, and I had never told another living being everything that had happened. And he said, let's go in there, and I promise you, you'll never have to go back. And we went in there, and he met my stepdad, and he had that bone-crushing handshake to kind of set my head or set Dan in his position and Dan smiled he took it and then we left and I called my mom and said you know I'm going to be staying at Dan's parents house for a while because and I told her everything and so we did we hit it off and we got engaged we got married we had three little girls and when that night we were watching TV and it was actually President Kennedy that was speaking my husband's a major history buff and if the history channel is not on the house he's not home so it, he said, you know, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And those words hit me like a ton of bricks. I was doing the dishes, and I just turned around because I had a very, I'm a Christian, but I had been exceptionally bitter about my experiences. There was all these ads out there, oh, we're going to help you. If you've got a problem, you come talk to us. Well, I had tried. I had talked to our school librarian and told her minorly what had happened, and nothing was done. And at that point, I just kind of froze up and realized that no one's going to help me. You're all going to say you want to help me, but no one's really going to help me. And when I heard Kenny speak those words, I thought, you know what? Maybe it's going to take someone like me standing up and doing something. And this, if my daughter was three years old, so it was probably 25 years ago. And April 10th, um, we had the statute of limitations bill pass the House. And it already passed the Senate. It wasn't my husband's version, but it was nearly identical. And a lot of times in politics, what you'll see is a House version and a Senate version that look very similar. And we're just hoping one of them gets to the committee, one of them gets to the rules, one of them gets to the floor. And last session, we had Dan's bill was four votes away on the calendar from being heard. 
and, and taking a vote on the floor. Tim Sheldon was texting me the whole time. It's almost there, Dino. I think we can make it, but the cutoff was 5 o'clock. Now, you can suspend the rules, and you can bring a bill back after the cutoff point. And they did. They brought back a bill for orca whales because they're really important. They're way more important than little girls and boys that are being abused by other people. So that was kind of hard, and it was kind of crushing. And it's very hard to come forward with your truth sometimes because as a child, my stepfather would um, dad mount me to everybody he could. I didn't have a friend in the family. I didn't have a friend anywhere that would believe me because he had set me up to be this, this really negative person, this, this troublemaker, this problem child. And it was really hard. And I had kept it a secret from my little brother because I didn't want to put that on his plate on top of everything else. And when I had told the librarian, there was a call to CPS. They did come to my brother's school and they took him aside and they asked him if my mother had ever abused him. It went to exceptionally graphic detail. And my brother got very angry. This just hit him out of the blue. He had no idea what was going on. And he, my mom went to get him from school that day and he was enraged. She picked him up and he was pounding his fist on the car saying, what is going on? And so she told him everything. Unfortunately, my stepdad had got to him first and said that these lies might actually come up. This might actually happen, so be aware, it's on the, on the horizon. And my brother didn't believe me. And my brother was my buddy through everything. My parents were divorced when I was seven. We were very close. We attended school together, and it was a very big blow to our relationship. So moving forward, we have the three daughters, and we're you know, setting up our life together. And I, I heard Kennedy's words, and I thought, you know, it's time to quit being bitter. It's time to be the change I want to see in the world. And so um, I started reaching out to other people and talking. When someone had a problem, we would discuss it. And then 9-11 happened. And at the time, I'll just be honest with you, I didn't know if I was a Democrat or a Republican. I asked Dan, I said, so what are we? I said, I think I'm a liberal because I'm really about liberty. I think people should have the right to do what they want to do with their lives and what they do in their home is none of my business. And he goes, yeah, I, I can see that. And then we looked up the platforms. And that changed everything. Because pretty much everything on that Republican platform, it, it marked my ideals. And we were, became very inspired. Um, time you know, kind of moves faster than you think it does. And in 2005, we, I went to real estate. My youngest daughter was seven. So I decided it was time to start my career. And I did. And we ended up moving it from Shelton to Allen. And that's where Dan's hometown, where he had grown up. And he said, you know, they're having this caucus thing. You want to try it? And I'm like, yeah, let's go, to, let's go try it. Let's go meet some people. So we went in there, and we met some wonderful people who invited us to their Lincoln Day dinner. And Dan's like, I want to go to that. I'm like, yeah, sounds good. So we went and we, we hit it off with quite a few people there and they asked us, they said, you guys should run for state committee man and state committee woman. I'm like, what does that mean? That just sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> and, and I'm new at this and I had, I had a million excuses. If you need excuses to not volunteer, I've got them. So anyhow, it, it turned out that I thought, you know, God presses things on your heart and it was something that I thought, you know, let's give it a try. Worst thing we have to do is ask somebody for help, right? But how hard is that? You know, if they want us to do it, they're going to be willing to help us, or they'd be doing it themselves. <laughs> so um, I was elected to state committee woman. Dan was elected to state committee man. And um, we went to the state, the state party. And um, I was then elected to the 6th Congressional District to represent as the Republican woman. And so we got to know a lot of people. We, we got to know quite a bit about what was going on. And then Dan had an injury. He was in the fire department, and the patients these days have become a lot larger than they used to be, and he tore his tendon in his elbow. And so he was laid up. And he was watching TV, and I would come home from real estate and chat with him, and he was kind of angry and bitter. And I was getting a little fed up with it because I'm, I like to be positive, and I like to see what we can do better, not what we're doing wrong. And I finally had had enough, and I said, you know, I don't, excuse the language, I said, you know, quit the bitching and start fixing. If you're not going to get up and do something about it, I don't want to hear about it. And he was kind of quiet that night. And the next thing I know, he's even more active in the party. And he says, you know, I think I want to run for office. I said, awesome. That would be great. That's way better than sitting in a chair and complaining. So anyhow, he, um, he decided that he would go over to Washington, D.C., and he took a class. And it was all about campaign management and running a campaign. It was the leadership institute. And they were amazing. And so him and Pat Charleswell got together, and they decided to run a campaign. And I thought, okay, let's do this. See what happens. 
Well, in the, in the primary, Dan got 40, I believe it was 49.7% of the vote. And that was very, it was a few hundred votes. We calculated if like 400 people change their mind, he's, a, he's an elected official. And we could actually get something done. Instead of complaining, we could do something. And at that same time, um, Facebook was just starting to launch, so I got him all set up on that, and I got him his Twitter account. We, we started kind of putting everything out there, and we worked really hard, but we didn't have any money. And the 35th at that time was solid blue. So what are you going to do, right? And we could just try. So we tried, and he came very, very close. But fundraising was really challenging because everyone kind of figured the other guy was going to win, and she did. And then Dan said, well, we were really close. Let's do it again. I said, all right, let's do it. And one thing we learned from the first election that we had been totally caught off guard by was that when he ran and he spoke and he talked to things that mattered in the district, and one of them was that we had a two-thirds majority vote initiative where they, they could not raise our taxes unless two-thirds of the representatives agreed to it. Well, in our district, that passed at 72.9%. So that told us that if we could get those people that voted for that initiative to understand their representative voted against them and Dan would vote for them, that we might have something. And it started working, and it was resonating with people. And so we ran again, and we noticed that when Dan would get up and speak, people would listen, and it started shifting the conversation. In a district we didn't think we could win, it shifted the conversation to a point where people were listening and saying, you know, that's a great idea. I've never heard someone so plain spoken before, and they were really excited. And it wasn't the typical topics that are near and dear to my heart. I'm pro-life. I have some very strong opinions about the Second Amendment, and I think that as a victim of assault, that I think we should carry guns. I have my concealed weapons permit. I feel very strongly, but that wasn't exactly where the conversation went because that divides people. And we knew that 72.9% of the people in that district supported the two-thirds majority vote. And so it's, if you're going to be a representative, you've got to represent people. So we started talking about it, and it, it, it was amazing, the turnaround. Dan ran three times, and the third time he won by 500 votes, which was not a lot, but it was enough. And so he went to the Olympia, and it was kind of surprising. It's not always what you think. And that's one thing I was going to talk about tonight was that the people you think are your enemy and the people that think are, you think are your friends are not always in those positions. And so when Dan got there, he realized that, you know, there was topics that he could look at the Democrats on the left and say, hey, we agree on a few things. And Dan came home one night, and I had forgotten all about Kennedy's speech. I'm all on this other path now, and I want a Republican president, and I want a Republican governor, and I had my, my agenda, right? And God has a funny way of saying, uh-uh, remember we talked about something a long time ago? We're still working on that. So what we did was, um, Dan said, I wrote you a bill. I said, oh, great, what was it? And he says, I want to remove the statute of limitations on, on felony sex crimes. And I just started crying. And it's like, it wasn't on my mind. It wasn't anywhere where I was. And I said, okay. And I support my husband. So um, the first year, it didn't even get out of committee. And a lot of the times that that's happened with, our, with Republicans is that we put things that are awesome bills in a committee and nothing happens. You have to wonder, why was that or that's a great bill? And um, there's a lot of, there's partisan and then there's nonpartisan. It's all kind of mixed together. So Dan wrote it again the next year. And that year they asked us to testify. And Dan said, would you mind testifying? I'm like, hey, we came this far, why not? You know. So I got up and I spoke about my experience and how um, my stepdad had drilled a, a hole in the floor of the upstairs to watch me while I showered in the bathroom below and, and some pretty creepy, nasty things that had happened. And um, around that time, our, our daughter had recently been raped in Alaska and we went through that experience with her and her going through a rape kit and all that entailed. And so um, we got up and talked about it and this is where social media came in. I was just open about it. I'm like, you know what, rip the band-aid off. It was one of the most personal, most devastating things in my life that I never wanted another living soul to know about. But then other living souls came up to me and said, me too. And I was like, really? And they said, when you gave your testimony, it was like you were sharing my story. And I said, really? And there were so many of them. And then I started noticing a pattern. So on Facebook, I, I would post, hey, here's my testimony. This is what I said. I'm just going to own it. And someone would privately message me and tell me their story. And I was, I was really surprised by that. And then pretty soon, they were posting right up front on my page. They're just claiming it, saying, yep, it happened to me, and this is what my experience was. And none of us had justice. All of us had missed this, this timeline that we didn't even know about. I have to admit, I knew a little bit about it. My mom told me I had until I was 21 to, to do it, and I called eight days before my 21st birthday, and then I, would, I had no assistance at that point. 
there was not enough time to bring the case forward. And I didn't realize that it took a while to actually compile a case. You know, when you're 21, your, your focus can be other places. So um, anyway, I testified, and we started getting the media involved. And then I had some friends, and I started noticing things, that these were not all Republican people that were talking to me and thanking me for coming forward. They were from all walks of life. They were Democrats, they were Republicans, they were people that didn't care about politics at all. And we were reaching them. And I thought, this is amazing. And I said, would you like to testify? Dan's going to do the bill until it passes. And they said yes. And I have to say, one of my dearest friends, Janet, is a die-hard liberal. And it's a little challenging sometimes because when she gets on Facebook, I read things and I'm just shaking my head, like, oh my, don't comment, don't comment, don't comment. <laughs> because I really, really want to. And I wanted to say how wrong this opinion is. But you know what? She's entitled to her opinion. That's what this country is all about. Well, the one thing I've noticed about Janet, Janet and I are different. I am very pro 2 way all the way. And she is not. And I talked to her and I said, how do you expect to defend yourself if you find yourself in a bad position? I said, we all know that the, the police failed us, the courts failed us, we didn't get help when we needed it, we didn't have anyone we could rely on. I said, you kind of have to rely on yourself. And she started looking at things and seeing it a little differently. And she kind of opened her mind because we found that common ground. And I was reading your flyer for your conference and I love the fact that you guys want to talk about things that you can agree on. So, in 20, I think it was 2013, I was the chairman of the Mason County Republican Party. And I had a really nice collection of Republicans. But we had things that we all agreed on. We had a lot of things that we varied on. But we all agreed on certain topics, and we stuck to those topics, and we united, and we started making progress. We raffled off an AR-15. It was the best raffle we'd had in years. People yeah. loved buying those tickets. It was exciting. I had to jump through a million hoops in Olympia to get the permission to do that. But we did. And I just think that anything we want to do is possible. The one thing I would like to, to remind everyone tonight is while we probably all think much alike in this group, we'll find ourselves in situations where no one really thinks like us, and to reach across those barriers and try and find that common ground. Because a lot of times, the opinions that you're seeing on Facebook, it's not to put down younger people, but a lot of times they're fed these opinions. And you can tell because the statements all match identically, and they're not different. And they're not coming from them, they're coming from what they hear. And a lot of that comes from fear. So when I go back in time and I look at the Dinah who thought she was a liberal, I, I look back and I'm like, why did you think that way? Why did you vote some of the ways that you voted? And when I really honestly look at that, I know how to reach this other generation. I know why they're thinking that. They're not bad people. They're not always informed people. And I think if we can find that common ground where we can have something that we can hug over, we can also find that common ground and say, hey, have you thought of this? Or what about this idea? Or would you help me? Because people are really honored to be able to help others. And we all want to be that person in the world that makes a difference. So um, April 10th, Dan, Dan had his bill, had passed the House. And it passed the House, it was, I believe this last time it was in 94. Um, and there was a couple absent um, representatives, and the other bill had passed the Senate. And as we know, we have a Democrat House, we have a Democrat Senate, and we have a Democrat governor who comes by every now and then to our state and visits us. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so um, it, the bills were neck and neck. They both had passed their second reading in rules, which means they're going to be headed to the floor soon. And um, the Democrat bill somehow beat out the Republican bill, but they were virtually identical. So having that said, we are thrilled. We're calling it a victory because I don't care whose name is on it. It's not about whose name or who did it. It's about the people we're doing it for. And what the statute of limitations right now, if you are 16 and under and you have been raped and abused, you have the rest of your life to be able to prove that case and come forward with it, which is really huge. The barrier is the longer you wait, the harder it is to bring evidence forward. And. Um, I just, I feel like it's a huge victory. It's one of those things where these people are finally going to have a chance to be heard. But I think the biggest thing for the legislation, I'm thrilled it passed, but one of the biggest things is that these survivors all got together, just like we're doing here, just like the conference you're talking about. We all got together and said, hey, we've got a common goal. And I'm not embarrassed to tell you, we use change.org, and we set it out there. And we're saying, hey, sign up. We got 5,000 people to sign up. We had Democrats harassing their um, liberal leaders in Seattle, senators and, and representatives saying, hey, you need to pass this bill. I want to know why you haven't passed it. I want to know why you haven't heard it. And we all got together and made a difference. And there's a lot of things in Washington State that we can do together. 
the Second Amendment is a, a big deal to me. And that's an area that we find, we doorbell, we don't pick just Republican houses or just Democrat houses, we doorbell houses. And that's one of the things that everyone pretty much agrees with. But the other thing that's a great conversation starter is we talk about um, building permits. Have you ever pulled a building permit? And that's when you know you're gonna have a lengthy stay at the door because if they've pulled a building permit, they're gonna tell you what that was like. And it's, it's really interesting where you can find that common ground. And everybody believes that they should have their rights. The problem is some of these people don't believe you need your rights. And that's where we have to speak up and be strong. But I was just so thrilled on April 10th when that, that bill passed the Senate. It wasn't my husband's bill. It was close to what my husband's bill was, but it's what we wanted. And I think it's going to make a big difference in our state. And the, the secondary message I believe it sends is not only do we support our survivors from these crimes, but I believe it's going to send a message to those who want to commit those crimes to say, you know what, I wouldn't do that in Washington. You're probably going to get caught. Maybe not now, but you will get caught. Because a lot of these crimes are serious. So what happened to me, my stepfather abused my um, three-month-old stepsister. And then he abused her friends. And that was, I, I lose track of the states he was in. He went from Alaska to Oregon to Idaho to Washington to California and Texas. And there were victims all along the way. But when he was getting close, and I think he understood where I was at, I was getting old, and I was getting rebellious at 13, I, I kind of went wild. And I ended up going to a program called Teen Challenge in Florida, where they sent a lot of kids that are rebellious and wild. And that's where I found God. And um, I used to testify every week, we sang every week, we raised funds, and we worked really hard to spread the message that don't judge people on the acts they've committed. Look at how you can help them make a better life. And um, I connected with people down there. I had a good friend that died of AIDS. I had another friend that was married to the Mexican Mafia. Um, we're not close anymore. <laughs> but there's the, the people that you would normally judge and say, oh, I know about you. I can tell what you're about. May not always be there for the reasons you think, because every one of them, and I call them my sisters, they all had similar stories. We all started out the same way. And it's the choices you make afterwards and the support we give those people when they've been faced with those insurmountable odds because my stepdad was very good at trying to shut me up. Not only did he alienate me from our friends and family and, and all that, but he would, he would butter me up after he abused me. For the next two weeks, I could do no wrong. And as a kid, you get away with murder. That's kind of intoxicating, you know? And then something would happen again. And I'd be angry that I'd fall on the board. And it happened time and time again until I finally escaped. And I have to tell you, Dan saved me. If Dan hadn't listened to me and taken me seriously, I don't know where I would be today because I had enough. I'd reached my limit. I'd like to say that my children never got to experience that because we fought so hard and we saved them, but we didn't. My daughter was raped in Alaska, and um, she called me up. And a lot of times I hear people tell me, well, you know, we got to do early reporting. In fact, one of my big beefs with the um, Democrat senator from Seattle was the reason we have a statute of limitations is to encourage early reporting. Well, I can tell you that doesn't do a lot of good if you don't have a place for them to go and report that. We had an incident this last, I think it was last year, where a young woman went to Harrison Hospital because she'd been raped. And I, you know, when you when you go to the hospital, usually you feel crummy, but usually you're not the actual crime scene. So she's sitting there, dirty and hurting and emotionally wounded, devastated, and and they didn't tell her for hours that they couldn't even couldn't even perform a rape kit. When my daughter went through hers, they, um, they stripped her down. They went over every square inch of her body. She was um, really abused. She had woke up in a smoldering fire pit from the night before. And there had been drinking. And she told me, she was, Mom, it's my fault. It's my fault. I know I shouldn't have done that, but I did. And this is why it happened to me. And I said, it's not your fault. I don't like that you drink. I really don't. Because that puts you in, in a bad situation, which you know has happened. I said, but none of this is your fault. And so I stayed with her on the phone while they performed the rape kit. And some people agree with me, some don't, but I hear her name because I told her I wasn't going to say it. Um, anyhow, I said, is it okay if I tell people what happened? And she said, yes. And I put it on Facebook. I didn't disclose her name. And all of these messages started pouring in. And they were saying, May, you know, it's, it happened to me. You're going to be fine. You're going to survive this. You're not alone. And as she was having that rape kit performed, and it's not quick. Um, they, they swabbed your entire body. Um, I read her all of those messages, and she was just so thrilled that people believed her and that she was being taken seriously. Before she had gotten to the hospital, and she, and she talked to each other several times, because I'm here in Washington, she's in Alaska, and she was saying, 
tell me what happened. And I said, well, where are you now? And she goes, well, I'm in downtown Seward. And I said, okay. And I said, can you get to a police station? And she goes, she was like completely out of her mind. She said, well, I saw a, a police car down the street that must be near a police station, right? And I said, N not necessarily. You don't just go walking down the street. I said, I'm not, tell me where you're at. Tell me what you see. And she described the different buildings there. And she described a Wells Fargo bank. And I said, I want you to go in that bank. And I want you to walk up to the teller and tell them exactly what just happened to you. And so she did. And they took her into a back room. They gave her a cold glass of water. They called the police. They came and got her. That's when she was taken to the cop car. She took her four hours in the cop car to get to where they could actually perform the test. And at that time, I was just horrified. I just wanted to hold my baby. I didn't want her to be away from me. So I, on social media, one of my husband's cousins from Arizona said, I have a family friend in Alaska. I said, you do? And she goes, she'll come and sit with your daughter. And I'm like, oh, thank God. Because I just was so afraid for her. And so after the rape was performed, Megan was taken to a domestic violence shelter. And um, it was really tough to communicate because they really want to keep their anonymity there. And they knew who we were, but they were very cautious. And she was doped up on all this medication to help her sleep. And so I talked to her that night, and I said, okay, I've got airplane tickets for you, because one of my friends is an airline stewardess, and she turned in all of her miles and got my daughter a plane ticket home. Because the way it was set up, there was no way for us to get there faster than I could get late in the morning, and I got everything set up, and she's leaving, and she's groggy in the morning. I could barely get her out of bed, and it was hard because we had this roundabout way of getting her attention because they can't disclose who's at the shelter, and it was, it was challenging to get a hold of her. And she goes to the airport, and my friend, she has this, um, or my cousin had this friend that came there and sat with her, and this black lady, and she goes, can you send me a picture of your daughter? I said, yes. And I said, can you describe me, yourself to me? Because I hadn't met her before. And so she did, and she was waiting for my daughter when she got there, and she just hugged her and held her, and was so supportive, and it just meant the world to me. And I was scared because these hiccups, so she was going through security, and she had gone to Seward, Alaska, because she was into the fishing. She was going to fish until her little heart was content, and she was going to save all of her money up, and she was going to pay for her college education. I mean, as a mom, Dan and I were kind of, I don't like the idea of Alaska, but wow, to go pay for your college education and to work so hard like that, when she was raped, all of her money had been taken. And when she was going through security, she wasn't going to give up her fishing boots, but they wouldn't fit in her luggage. And I'm like, honey, throw the boots on the garbage. Just get on that plane. And she was afraid. She goes, I can't, I can't, I can't give up these boots. And they're just hip waders. I mean, that's, and that broke my heart. And we got her home, and she went to her boyfriend, and he um, accused her of doing it on purpose, and that it was all her fault. And everything that you wouldn't want to tell a sexual assault survivor, he told her. And then he got angry, and he beat her up, and he threw her, and her face hit a heater. And when she called me, she was talking to him. I'm like, honey, what's wrong? You sound like you're lisping or something. And Dan's like, go get her. It's like he just had this gut instinct and he knew. And when I got her, I would let her see her dad because it, it was pretty brutal looking. I took her directly to urgent care, and we called the police. And we waited for hours. They did x-rays of her face, nothing was broken. But we waited, and we waited, and we waited. And I kept, the nurses would come in and say, you know, are, are the police on their way? And I, I would call dispatch and they would say, yes, you guys are in, in the queue. You know, they're going to be there at some point. And eventually I said, you know, I think we're going to go home and have them interview her at our house because I don't want to sit here anymore. She's not comfortable. And we left urgent care and there was a police officer sitting there doing some sort of report on his laptop in his car. And that was a really hard moment as a mother to get past because I really wanted him there taking care of my daughter. Because I know one thing about domestic abuse survivors, but my mother was one, it's very, very hard for them to stay gone. A lot of times it's very tempting for them to go right back into that situation. And so we did have an officer arrive at the house and he interviewed my daughter. And he said, don't lie to me, I know the truth. Well, that didn't go over real well. And the next thing I know, her friend's pulling up in the driveway and she's gone. And she went back to the boyfriend. And she was gone for a couple weeks before she came back again. And when I, when I talked to um, the senator that was against the bill and said, you know, we need a statute of limitations in place because we need people to go ahead and report early, we've got to remove some of these other barriers. We need to have people be able to report and be taken seriously and understand that it's really critical that they get care. 
I, we had a lady, it was about six months ago at Mason Journal show up, and they didn't perform rape kits, and she was there to have, to report her abuse, and they said, well, you probably should just go to St. Peter's. I can't imagine someone being in a traffic accident, and someone saying, hey, why don't you go drive yourself to the hospital? You know, I, I really think it's time that these people start being taken more seriously, and I'm working with um, Dan and some other survivor groups in the area, because what I'd like to see is I'd like to see us on call, and I would have no problem going to Mason General and holding that woman's hand, driving her to St. Pete's and staying with her the entire way. We really need to support these people. And I think that we're really getting close. I think this bill is an excellent start, but I think if we really want to put our money where our mouth is, we really need to be there and support these victims. And I don't think it's going to cost a lot of funds. I would do it for free. There's a lot of the survivors that would go there and just pick them up and view them like that woman that was with my daughter in Alaska. And I think it's really important that we reach out and we let them know that it's okay, you can talk to me. And it's amazing where Megan is now. Um, they're going to be closing on their first home on May 5th. And she's married. She has two little kids. And she, I told her I was probably going to talk about it tonight. And she goes, make sure you tell them how brutal that experience is. She goes, there's no other crime out there where people try and quiet you. And they, they make it out as though you're embarrassing them because you're reporting a crime. And I, I have to agree with her. And so this fight might be over in this section, but I think we're going to keep moving because as we've talked about it openly, every single encounter we have with other people, they come forward and they share more. Um, we understand there was a person in Kitsap County that contacted my husband because in a library, there was a person doing pornography and their small daughter was watching it and they couldn't shut it off. And that's up to the librarian's discretion. And that puts them in a pretty awkward position. My brother works security at a library in Olympia, and they have a lot of people that now, instead of coming there to get free information, they come there to shoot up drugs. And it puts the librarians in a pretty dangerous situation. So there's a lot of things that we can do. There's a lot of areas we can improve. But I think the biggest one that we got out of most of this was that people aren't afraid to talk about it anymore. And I think that's, that's really important. And we did get a lot of conversations, and I love the conversations because I think if we're talking openly, we have to hear all ideas. And one of them was um, Kavanaugh. They would tell us that, you know, well, what about false accusers? There still is, you still have to have evidence. And having evidence is really important. And so a lot of these cases can't always go to trial or go to court as we want them because there isn't always the evidence. But we can always support each other. So if we don't have the evidence, we can support. and. If we do, we can move forward. So um, I did want to draw that one distinction with, with the Kavanaugh, and that was people complain about that a lot. But that was something really different because the president had nominated someone. And I don't know if many of you remember Ken Starr from the Clinton investigation. Well, Kavanaugh had worked, worked with him pretty aggressively. So he was a target. And um, a lot of people came out and accused him. But ultimately, because we had that conversation in public, he was you know, found that there was no evidence, and he was cleared. And so I just want people to remember this. What we're fighting for is for people to have a right to live their lives in peace. And then it's really important to honor their freedoms and their liberties as well. Thank you. Yeah, I'll answer any questions. What's the number of the bill? The one that passed was 5649. And I actually have copies of it right here, or a copy. So if somebody wants to look at it, you're more than welcome to. And then um, one other thing that we did get through, and this is something I wasn't aware of, was um, third degree rape. And I've got a definition of first, second, and third degree. And I, you know, third degree had a big burden of proof that was required. And that was that if, um, if you were raped, you had to prove that you fought it off. And that was really challenging because we've learned a couple things with some of the studies that have gone on. We have three different responses that people are recognizing. There's fight, there's flight, and there's freeze. And third degree rape is, is hard to prove if someone freezes because they don't move. And there's no evidence that they fought because they're terrified. And so there is, um, that's one thing that we're looking at. There's no other thing that we're aware of that requires that much of a burden of proof that you had a crime committed against you. So is there any questions? You mentioned Seattle a couple times, and, uh, and then the Kavanaugh. It sounds like you're, you're in the mix of knowing who's who, and maybe you might know some results of the uh, Seattle mayor, Murray. Um, that seems to have dropped off the radar. It's, it's, it's the same thread of information you're giving. Can you 
Can we give you some thoughts on the stuff you may have heard? I can give you some interesting thoughts on that. So um, the first year I told you my husband's building get out of committee. The next year it did, and it passed out of the House, and it went to the Senate. When it went to the Senate, we had um, every, a, uh, a Democrat Senator, J.D. Peterson, and he didn't want to hear the bill at all. And the interesting thing was, my husband had approached him numerous times trying to have conferences, trying to figure out how we could have this bill heard. The morning that um, Devlin Hecker died, he was the one that had accused Mayor Murray, and there was a lawsuit involved. He died in a hotel room from a drug overdose, which is probably common with someone who has been in that. But I still have some doubts if he was given a little push. Anyhow, um, at 7 o'clock, I believe it was, my husband got a, a phone call from J.D. Peterson saying that he was willing to hear the bill. At 7.30, I heard on the news that Denny, or Devlin had died. And I make your own conclusions. I have mine. <laughs> and I will tell you that J.D. Peterson is very tight with it. And if you look at some of the quotes that Senator Peterson had out in the press, um, it's, it's pretty interesting. He thinks that people need to move on with their lives. Yet the bill that passed the Senate, not my husband's bill, but the one that just passed, um, he was the co-sponsor. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm given to understand that when lobbying for a bill, that when it's in committee, that it's important to try to influence the committee members as opposed to just any random legislator. Is that an appropriate technique that we should do? I, I think that's a really good idea to talk to the committee members and look at who's on, serving on that committee. Um, I know that when we heard the bill before, Jan Angel was on the Law and Justice Committee, and there's usually six or seven members on a committee, and it's important to talk to them. It's also important to talk to other people you think could influence them. Because, I mean, as we know, you know, Frank Chop is the Speaker of the House right now, so I'm assuming he has quite a bit of influence on any committee. And we have those members that do stand out that you can consult with and talk to. And, and I think pressure is the biggest thing. When we had the change.org thing going on, that made a huge impact because those were people from their own party telling them, what are you thinking? We want this bill. And we had, I had my friend Jana was writing up pieces in the Seattle, um, it was the stranger that she was working with and some other different groups. And that's one thing where I, I really learned about, it's not just reaching across the aisle, it's like reaching everybody. Because if I had not friended Jana based on the fact that she didn't agree with some of my political beliefs, I don't think we would have got this bill passed. So. We have time for one more question. Anybody has? Go ahead. Uh, Jeff, who had the question? I, I was going to uh, just change the subject a little bit. Dan Griffey is our representative, and uh, I, I think it I think it'd be interesting if you would tell the public how much Dan won his election by the last time. It was just about fifty eight percent. So he's he's growing his uh, his strength, and he's a great representative. We do have some people that will tell him, "Hey, you're the first Republican I've ever voted for." So you know, and I think it's having that that conversation with people and just not saying, we're going to stick to this topic. You know, what do you want to talk about? Everybody give a good hand, please. So we would be remiss of not giving a memento, right? Yeah. And so uh, some of the bling that you can share also from the back of the room. But how can you not walk away without a teapot from a tea party meeting? Huh? Thank you very much. Thanks for coming.